Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Gary Severance with Henry Schein, and I'll be your moderator for this evening's program. I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Joshua Austin as our speaker tonight, as he will be discussing fundamentals of preparation and provisionals and proven best practices to help decrease your remake percentage and shave a few minutes off your crown appointments. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment just to go over some housekeeping rules. If you do have a question, please type it into the box labeled Q&A on your console, and we'll answer those live at the end of the program. This webinar is sponsored by 3M. And lastly, Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation, live or on demand. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Austin. Welcome, and thank you for being with us tonight. It's such an honor to be with you guys. And uh, hopefully we're going to have a, a good time tonight. Special thanks to 3M for their help with this. And uh, as always, a, a great company that does great things in dentistry. We are, we are fortunate to have them uh, working as a, a partner with all of us in our practices. This is my dad. And I show my dad before every lecture I do because I'm proud of him. I'm proud of what he did for dentistry. He practiced for 25 years in Amarillo, Texas, which is up in the Panhandle up near Oklahoma. And then in 1983, uh, he sold his practice in Amarillo and we moved to San Antonio, where he began teaching at the dental school. And recently I found some photos of my dad's old office. And it's always fun to look at those uh, photos because it's kind of like looking at dentistry uh, with a time machine to see uh, to see what, what things used to be like. And so here uh, is the outside of my dad's dental office, the Amarillo Dental Group, a five doctor group practice that opened in 1974. Nowadays, a five doctor group practice is no big deal. We see uh, bigger group practices in almost every community in the country. But in 1974, this was pretty revolutionary. Um, this was the biggest dental group, biggest group practice west of the Mississippi when this opened in 1974. So I'm proud of my dad for, for seeing that, you know, uh, group practice was a viable method to practice dentistry. In. And and uh, the building still exists. It's no longer a dental office, though. It's now a radio station and TV station for the city of Amarillo, Texas. If we take a look inside the office, you will see an interior design motif that I call classic, modern, timeless. I mean, you can't tell if this photo was taken in 1958 or in 2018, right? Of course, I'm being sarcastic. This is the most 70s photo I've ever seen in my life. This room is literally out of a design catalog that was published in the 70s, right? It does not get any more 70s than this. From the guy in the plaid jacket on the left-hand side of the screen, um, all the way to the front desk without any computers on it, which is kind of weird today to see. And then you see our, our two uh, business uh, assistants up front uh, just having a little gossip session, have a little gap fest right there in front of a uh, waiting room full of patients. Nice systems there, Dad. Did you uh, get your team under control here? There's no gossiping in front of a waiting room full of patients. What are we doing? This next photo is my second favorite photo of the whole series. This is my dad's office manager, Georgia, the epitome of a sassy Southern woman. Uh, she used to say things like kiss my grits unironically, like as part of her normal lexicon. And uh, she had that beehive haircut from 1958 until the day she died in 2004. And I miss her greatly. If you look behind her on that countertop, you'll see Dentrix G1, just a sheet of paper where they wrote people's names down. How did anybody show up for an appointment? We text patients an hour before their appointment now, and they still sometimes forget well, how, how did this work when you wrote their name down six months before their appointment and somehow they miraculously showed up for an appointment? We must have just been better human beings back in the 70s. I love the woman behind Georgia holding up the file cabinet here um, and her white slacks and white shoes. Just the, just the confidence it takes to wear white slacks to work. I, I hope this is before Labor Day. I've never understood those rules about when you're not supposed to wear white, like after Labor Day. Like, technically, everything's after Labor Day. Um, if you want to get real technical about it, but uh, never understood that. But I also could never wear white pants to work because by 815, I'd have ink, I'd have um, some profi paste, I'd have part of my breakfast and half of my cup of coffee on those white pants. So props to her for being able to pull that off. This is something I don't have in my office. It's right, a library. I mean, I guess I do have a library. I have a thing called Google, but in 1974, we didn't have that. She used to have, a, have to have a place to look up stuff and have journal articles and textbooks. There's something else in this room I don't have in my office. It's on the conference table. It's at the end of it. You may notice that. That's right, an ashtray inside of a dental office. Well, that must be a mistake, right? Somebody must have just left that there on accident. 
Nope. We used to smoke inside of this dental office. Just inside, we used to have a smoke and coffee break room inside of the office. That's exactly what's happening here. We've got our business assistant with our cup of Sanka and pack of Virginia Slims. Just in the middle of the day, inside, blowing one out. I just cannot imagine smoking inside of a dental office and then going to do a hygiene exam with the same hands that I just smoked a cigarette with, with no gloves on. I mean, what must this office have smelled like? What does it smell like when you mix eugenol with Marlboro 100s? That's what this office smelled like. Here's one of the operatories looking great. I mean, just a, a, a fabulous design here. Um, uh, cabinets, wood paneling, great. Phone in the off, on the operatory, right by the patient's head when the patient's head is reclined. Just iconic 70s stuff. We got an x-ray head that looks like it came out of the Death Star on that uh on a on a pole that's chair mounted uh with what looks like a clock in it that no doubt uh measures exposure time in minutes not milliseconds so uh you know just the best of 70s technology here uh, uh on on display if your office looks like this please contact your Henry Shine design team they can they can absolutely help you and this is my favorite photo of the entire series this is my dad and I just wish I knew what the photographer said to him before they took this picture. The only thing I can imagine is he's asking, who in the heck picked red carpet? Because I cannot take a look at this photo with this long red hallway and not think of one thing from the 70s. That's right. The Shining. Oh, my God. This office has Overlook in vibes from The Shining. And if I told you, and this is true, that every room down this hallway was a hygiene room, if I had to get up every hour to do that many hygiene exams, it would take me about one round of those hygiene exams before I started breaking down the door with an ax, just like Jack Nicholson in The Shining. Here's Joshy just going crazy. It would take me literally an hour for that to happen. So why are we here tonight? We're not sophomore dental students. We're, we're talking about something so basic, what is basically a crown prep and a provisional, right? So why do we spend any time doing that? Well, in my practice, a single unit crown preparation is one of the most profitable procedures that I do. The average fee for a crown in the United States is around $1,200. If you can perform that procedure in an hour or less, 40 minutes to an hour, it can be the main fuel for our practice's profitability. Costs are up. Inflation is up. We have to work efficiently so that we can remain profitable. And taking time to analyze and improve our most profitable procedures can only help us overcome these uncertain financial times. So our goals tonight are simple. We want to learn how a system to reduce the tooth adequately for the material we want. That's our goal for a crown preparation. We then need to give the laboratory an accurate representation of what we prepped. Whether that be analog or digital, we have to give the lab an accurate representation. And then finally, we need to prevent and we uh, prevent the tooth that is now reduced from moving in the space that we created, causing a crown that won't fit. That's what a provisional does. So those are our goals of any crown prep procedure we have. And so that's what we're going to go over tonight, step by step. Preparation reduces the tooth so that we have enough space for the material. The impression gives us uh, the representation to show the laboratory so that they can make us a prosthetic. And then finally, the provisional holds the reduced tooth in space so that it doesn't move. So let's start with preparation because that's where it starts in our office. I'm a big fan of the reverse crown prep technique. The reverse crown prep technique is a system that I'm going to walk you through, but the key is that it's a system. And what I want you to understand is I don't care what system you use just that you use a system. We were all taught systems to reduce teeth when we were in dental school. And they all generally involved depth cuts. And depending on what school you went to, they went different ways and where you started and where you finished. But no matter what, it was a system. And we go through dental school and we graduate. And then we all think we're Miles Davis. We think we are improvisational jazz musicians and that we are good enough to just improvise our way through a crown preparation. And what happens is we start missing things and we start under reducing teeth and not giving the laboratory what they need. There are some people that are Miles Davis that are just so talented with their hands that they can sit and with no system whatsoever, accurately prepare teeth time after time after time. I am not that person. I need a system. 
Systems are what keep us from creating error and mistakes. That's why pilots have systems before and checklists before we take off. That's why planes don't fall out of the air. If pilots ran their plane like most dentists run their dental office, planes would be falling out of the air left and right. So having a system is what keeps us from skipping steps, under-reducing, not giving our preferred partners like our laboratories what they need. So I don't care what system you use, just that you use a system. Reverse crown prep technique is not the system I was taught in dental school, but it's the way that works best for me. I'm going to walk through it. And if you love it, great, use it. But if not, that's fine. Just find the system that works for you. But the key is do that system every time. Work that checklist every time. Even if the pilot is flying from San Antonio to Dallas, it's a 40-minute flight, they still do the checklist. Even if this is the easiest crown prep you've ever seen, still do the checklist. That's what prevents error. So the reverse crown prep technique, uh, we're going to start with our pre-work diagnosis, right? Our data capture, radiographs, photos, preliminary impressions, all the things that we know we need before we can start. So for diagnosis, we're going to start with this tooth. This is the case that we're going to walk through. This is Ray. And Ray came in with pain on biting on number three. So we took a radiograph. We didn't see anything crazy, no abscesses or anything like that. So we ran through the protocol of testing it. First thing I did was a percussion test, not positive to percussion. Next thing I did was a cold test, vital to cold, but non-lingering. And then the third thing I did was use a tooth sleuth and do a bite test. And when I put the tooth sleuth on the mesial marginal ridge and Ray bit down on it, he lit up. So this is a classic cracked tooth syndrome. This is a tooth that we all see every week, multiple times a week. And since this was a pain case, this was worked in as an emergency. So I need to be able to quickly and efficiently get Ray diagnosed, get Ray taken care of, and get Ray prepped because this is what makes a difference between our hit us hitting our goal and not, is if I can squeeze this tooth in and get it prepped and make it happen in my practice. So we're going to prep a single unit crown made out of zirconia on this tooth for Ray. And this is my prep kit. This is my fur block for the reverse crown prep technique. And what you will find is um, a lot of burrs that you probably already have in your office. You'll see a 56 burr up in the upper right-hand corner. Then in the bottom, uh, in the upper left-hand corner, in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see all your barrel diamonds, your 856016, 856025, uh, 856025 fine. On the bottom left, you will see some depth cutters. These come in all different brands that you can find anywhere in the catalog at different depths. You have a 0.6 uh, millimeter depth cutter, a 1.0 millimeter depth cutter, and a 1.5 millimeter depth cutter. But the key to the reverse crown prep technique are the burrs on the top row besides the 56, those round diamond burrs. And I'll show you why those are the key in just a minute. So after we anesthetize the patient, get all our initial stuff that we need, photos, radiographs, preliminary impressions, first thing we're going to do is break interproximal contact. You can do this with a 169L, you can do this with a 56, a 330, a, a skinny barrel, 856012, whatever you want, just break the IP contact. This is what I was taught in dental school, um, was to break IP contact first. So we are not any different from where I started, uh, from where I learned how to prep teeth in dental school. So now we're going to move to step two. Step two is packing cord. Now, this is where we start to deviate from probably what you're used to. Packing cord usually happens at the end of the process, right? Why are we doing it so early? Well, we're doing it so early because we want to get the tissue out of the way for our next step, step three. So we have a cord packed in here, whatever cord you like soaked in, whatever you like to soak it in, hemodent, you like a braided cord, monofilament, whatever you're using, an epi cord, any of those things, whatever cord you normally use, go ahead and pack it here. This is a size zero cord on this since this is a molar. The reason we're packing our cord early is because at step three, we are going to go ahead and prepare our margin. And that seems way out of order, right? Because in my dental school system, it was always prep the margin at the end, right? We reduce everything first. And the last thing we do is the margin. Well, the margin is the most important part. So why don't we start with the end in mind? And that's what this does. And what I mean by this is we're actually kind of putting a depth cut in for the margin, which 
may seem impossible, but that's what our round diamond burr is used for. So I generally would use an 801.021 or an 801-018. Depends on what material I'm using. If I'm doing a lithium disilicate or an Emax crown, I would do an 801021. It's a little bit bigger. If I'm doing a zirconia crown, I would do an 801.018. And what happens is when you still have the axial wall of the tooth in place and you hold this round diamond burr in the long axis of the tooth, the axial wall prevents you from getting that round diamond burr any more than about halfway into the tooth. And if you look at that left side of the tooth there that's already prepped, you can see if you just hold over, if you just imagine the axial wall above it reduced, what you will see is that round diamond burr basically preps a perfect chamfer into the tooth. And a chamfer in a milled restoration world is the, is the finish line of choice. A shoulder is a finish line that was designed for PFMs when we had copings and stacking porcelain to the, um, to the uh, edge of the shoulder. In a milled world, which is what most of us use nowadays, we, are, we don't need to prep shoulders anymore. A chamfer is the perfect, perfect finish line for most milled restorations. In fact, all milled restorations. So when you start prepping the finish line this early with a round diamond burr, you have the axial wall that's keeping you from penetrating too far in the tooth. You end up with basically a perfect chamfer depth cut, something like this. And now all I have to do is reduce everything above that. And because we've already packed our cord, my finish line is already at the spot that it needs to be. I don't have to drop it later. Yeah, we'll smooth it out later, but I don't have to drop it anymore later to go subgingival. So that's sort of what our buckle finish line is going to look like um, after we do this uh, margin depth cut. Here we are. You can kind of see it from the palatal here, although not quite as well, but the same idea. We've got our finish line prepped almost all the way around the tooth at this point. We still have refining to do, but we've got it almost all the way around. The next step we're going to do is some occlusal depth cuts. This is where I use those depth cutter burrs. In this case, this is a zirconia crown. So I'm going to do a one millimeter depth cut here with those burrs. You can see I do some in the central groove. I do some on the cusp tips. The central groove is always the place that we are uh, going, going to err on under reducing. Labs always have a hard time getting enough space at the central groove. So I want to make sure and put a few dots there. So now we've got our depth cuts in the occlusal. And you can see in a couple spots, I'm not even all the way through the amalgam yet. So I know I'm a long way away from where I have to worry about any endodontic involvement. Now we are going to do our axial depth cuts. Same thing here. I'm going to do my axial depth cut so that I get enough axial uh, uh, preparation. I'm going to go kind of at that junction between the occlusal third and middle third, and I'm going to get put three different depth cuts here. You could do this at 0.6 or 1.0, depending on what your material is. In this case, it was zirconia. So those are 0.6 millimeter depth cuts. Now we've got a bunch of depth cuts in the tooth, right? We've got occlusal depth cuts. We've got axial depth cuts. We've got our margin depth cut and we've broken contacts. Now is a point where we just blend it all together. So it's kind of like painting by numbers. We blend all of those together. I'll use a, a, a barrel diamond burr like an 856018 or an 856021. And I just start blending all of that together till it looks like this. And now you can see I've got little tiny remnants left of those uh, occlusal depth cuts, especially on that amalgam. But we know we're going to take that amalgam out. So as long as I finish that out a little bit lower than there, we're going to be good. But we've got the vast majority of our crown preparation together, right? So now my next step is I'm going to go ahead and get the rest of that amalgam out of there. And I'm going to do a core buildup. You can use a couple of different products for this. Um, I would either use a bulk fill resin composite or a dual cure resin composite. Typically, because I want to do this sort of all in one increment if I can. And with either one of those two materials, I can make that happen without much problem. So I would use something like a Filtech 1 bulk fill here. And that will give us a nice um, uh, core buildup that will do very well, will scan very well, and uh, should uh, not give us any polymerization shrinkage um, that would give us any problem. So here is our amalgams out. Our rough preparation is done. Our buildup is in. 
Now it's just time to refine. And I would do this with a fine diamond, a red stripe diamond, any kind of barrel, whatever size is most comfortable for you. Um, and I would do this at around, you know, 40,000 RPMs in a slow speed manner. Um, and then as I get to the very end, I would dial it in with a little bit slower and do it dry, maybe 10,000 RPM and do it dry, make a few passes at the finish line with that. So now we're pretty much done with our preparation, but we need to double check one thing. The killer, the place where most labs battle with problems is an under reduction in the occlusal aspect. We have to give our laboratory enough space. If we don't give our laboratory enough space, we are scrambling around. We are scrambling around. So there's a few different ways that you can do this, but I think we always need to check. Until someone invents some sort of augmented reality contact lens or loops that can measure your reduction by just looking at it, you can't eyeball this. It just doesn't work. On a typodon, it might work to be able to eyeball, but when you have a tongue and cheek and spit and blood, it's difficult to eyeball, especially the further back you go. So having a gauge, this is the prepture by Contact Easy. This is a, uh, I believe, a one a one millimeter reduction here. If you can run that thing from uh, mesial to distal and not catch anywhere, then you have one millimeters of reduction. You know you're in pretty good shape, right? So we have to use something to check our reduction. We have to because under reducing is a problem. It's a huge problem. Just ask your laboratory. So when you under reduce a crown, there's only four things that you can do. So we've all gotten that phone call from the laboratory, right? Get the call. Hey, doc, I under reduced the tooth. You say, man, I prepped, I prepped the heck out of that tooth. What happened? And sometimes we did, sometimes we didn't. But at the end of the day, it just is, it's difficult to see. And our eyes can't necessarily tell the difference between 0.6 millimeters and 1.0 millimeter, right? So if you get that phone call from the lab, there are four ways that we can fix it. The first way is the way that never happens, right? The way that never happens is we bring the patient back, reappoint to renumb them up, reprep, re-impress or scan and reprovisionalize. That never happens in practice. It's a waste of everyone's time and it is by far a profitability killer, right? So that way never happens. The second way is the lab can make you something, a reduction coping, right? Reduction coping uh, is a little thing that fits over your preparation that shows you where you need to reduce more to get the uh, desired clearance. They're inelegant. You have to anesthetize the patient again if the tooth hasn't been endotreated. And you basically have to prep the tooth again, but you're doing it right before you deliver the crown. So not my ideal thing. And most labs charge for reduction coping. And I called 30 labs around the country, big labs and small labs, asked them how much they charge for reduction coping. The average cost was $41. Now, the average cost for a zirconia crown is $90. So if you do a reduction coping, that means that your lab fee has increased by 50%. Again, profitability gone. So that is not something I'd recommend. The third way that we can fix it is by far the best way. Reduce the opposing, especially on lower molars. Around 60% of the time, 50 to 60% of the time, depending on what article you read, Lower molars that we prep for crowns are opposed by upper molars with plunger cusps. And we could buy another 0.3 millimeters or so easily by just equilibrating the plunger cusps. Equilibrating the plunger cusps. Cusp. So what I want you to do is for the next 10 lower crown preps that you prep, the next 10 lower crown prep cases you see, while you're waiting for anesthesia, I want you to look at the opposing arch for a plunger cusp and see if you see it. And if you do go ahead and equilibrate it and you can buy yourself 0.3 to 0.4 millimeters before you even start prepping the tooth. So take care of the plunger cusp first. So reducing the opposing is a great thing to do. And then the fourth way that this can be done is a way that happens far most often. That's when we tell the laboratory on the phone, three magic words, make it work. And they do make it work. They make it work by making a thin crown, which is more likely to what? Fracture. So we typically under-reduce teeth in the guise of being minimally invasive. Have we been minimally invasive if we put a thin crown on a tooth? No. My supposition would be that we've been maximally invasive because we have set that tooth up for another intervention. So 
being minimally invasive is giving your laboratory the space they need. Now, that doesn't mean mow the tooth down to nothing, but be checking occlusion, use a guide like this and make sure that you have given the laboratory the space they need. That's being minimally invasive, not under prepping a tooth. So we're going to double check and make sure that we've reduced the tooth enough. So to review about the reverse crown prep te technique, um, it gives us con a consistent chamfer finish line with adequate reduction all the way around because we've used depth cuts. And it gives us a system to make sure that we don't skip steps and we don't get lost in the tooth, which has happened to me countless times. So have a system, develop your own system, come up with your own checklist and work through it on every crown prep you do. Make it a system, be more like a pilot. Unfortunately, you're probably not Miles Davis. You might be, but you're probably not. And to paraphrase my favorite, one of my favorite movies, Billy Madison, if prepping teeth poorly is cool, consider me Miles Davis. That's what I would say to that. Reverse crown prep technique. Uh, let's go through the steps again. First step is to break in a proximal contact with any burr you deem for that 169L, 55, 56, 856012. Any of those will work well. Then we're going to pack our cord, whatever cord you like. I like size zero braided cord with a little hemodent in it. That works for me. Next step, prep our margin with a round diamond burr. Uh, in this case, it was an 856018 because it was a zirconia. So that's going to give us around a 0.8 millimeter chamfer, which should be perfect for milling zirconia. Next up, occlusal depth cuts. Again, based on what restoration material you're using. You Got to know the prep standards for the material that you're using. Then we can do our axial depth cuts. Then step six, blend all our depth cuts together. Then we're going to take out uh, decay or previous restorative material and do our core buildup. And then finally, refine margins. And a big number nine that isn't listed here, double check with a guide to make sure that we prepped enough off of the tooth. So now we've prepped our tooth. We're going to move on to capturing that some way. And we would call that an impression, whether it be an analog impression or a digital impression some type of impression. So the first step in any impression procedure is tissue management. I was trained to do a second cord and then pull that cord right before we took the impression. That doesn't work very well in my hands. Um, generally using a, a larger cord here that gives us lateral um, uh, uh, retraction of the tissue so that we can flow our impression material into it. But what I found is when I pulled that cord, oftentimes it would start bleeding or I would get the first cord caught up in the second cord and I'd pull them both and we'd really bleed. So I don't love a second cord. I actually really like retraction paste. Retraction paste is a um, material that's been out on the market for uh, eight to 10 years and it works really well, both as a hemostatic and at lateral retraction. So I like um, 3M retraction paste, works very well, comes in this little compule, just like composite. You can put it in any type of composite applicator gun and you see that tiny little almost like mosquito tip that allows you to put accurate placement of that material into the sulcus. Then you have a patient bite down on a compra cap. Um, so a compra cap is basically like a hollowed out cotton roll. And uh, you just put this over the retraction paste, have them bite into it for two, four, five minutes, something like that. And that's going to give you a bunch of hemostasis and a, and a stringent action. And then it's going to laterally push the tissue out of the way. So here we are after a few minutes of retraction paste, and we are ready for our impression. Next step, obviously, an impression or a scan. Uh, in this case, we used Imprint 4 by 3M. I like Imprint 4. Uh, number one, I like this little syringe that comes in the package. Um, and I like uh, that it comes in a heavy and a light and that it's readable. And that syringe kind of works like this. You just hook it up to the actual tube and extrude it straight into that syringe. And then this syringe does the mixing of it. And then take your tray. Since this was a uh, single unit, not on a terminal abutment, I'm going to use a triple tray like most people use here and get our opposing and our bite registration all in one shot. And then of course, turns out like this. Now, why I like Imprint 4, uh, Imprint 4 is a really nice polyvinyl siloxane that gives us short intraoral set time. So it sets quick but it gives us a little bit of working time so that you can get it syringed around and not have to worry about it snap setting on you before you're ready. And it's pretty hydrophilic and it gives us a really nice detail capture. And the colors 
um, pop to me. The pink of the light body against the blue of the heavy body, I'm just really able to uh, to see the margin very well on that, and it looks pretty good to me. Um, so my eyes pick it up pretty well. Um, digital is also a great option, right? And this is honestly something that we use every day. The great thing about digital um, is that uh, we can um, get a you know, basically a digital occlusion here, a digital occlusion meter to know if we reduced enough and we can mark our finish line before it goes to the laboratory. So you can see here, this is the same exact case that was scanned as well as the impression taken. And we've sent that off. You can see our occlusion there. We've got plenty of reduction. We've got our finish line marked out. So our laboratory is ready to go. One of the other great advantages of using digital is something like this. So if you look at this, you can see that this case was prepped on June 19th. It was received at Glidewell on June 19th. It was in progress on June 19th, where it is marked as shipped on June 19th. So we prepped this on a Friday uh, in the morning. Um, Glidewell got it in the morning and then um, finished it that day, shipped it out on Monday. We got it in our office on Tuesday and we delivered it on Tuesday afternoon. So we prepped it on Friday, delivered it on Tuesday afternoon. And so digital does give you that option because you don't have the model work, right? So um, I love digital. Digital works great for me every single day. But if you're not at the point where you're going digital, I think Imprint 4 is a great option from an analog standpoint. And I use Imprint 4 a lot in bigger cases sometimes, um, and especially the full arch implant cases. It's a great option for that because of that extended working time, but short intraoral set time. So once you get it in place, it sets pretty quick. So one thing that uh, my mentor and best friend, Dr. Mike Detola, um, who really is responsible for a lot of this tonight, um, he, it's he, reverse crown prep technique is his baby. He developed it when he was at Glidewell. Um, this is a message that Mike Detola has been spreading for years because when Mike Detola worked within Glidewell Dental Laboratories, he got his crowns back very fast, obviously, because he was working there in the laboratory. So he didn't have a long way to go to ship the cases in. And he would deliver his cases, you know, two, three, four days later. And what he found is that things went in a lot better after that, that short period of time. So um, working faster and not waiting two weeks to deliver crowns, I think is great. It's obviously only possible if you're working in a digital workflow. But um, I'm going to show you ways in the next part to offset that if you aren't working in a digital workflow. Because all of that comes down to the provisional. The provisional is one of the most important procedures are important parts of the crown procedure, and it is most underrated. It is most underrated because it is the thing that is rushed through the most. It is handed off to a and delegated to a dental assistant, and then most of us don't even come back in the room and look at it again. And then we wonder why we have problems with crowns fitting later. And what I will tell you, it is this step right right here. If you're sloppy with your provisional, your final crown delivery is going to be difficult. That's it. The bottom line. That is biology, and we will talk about that. So what is the point of a provisional, right? Well, the first point of a provisional is that it holds mesiodistal space of a tooth. It's got to hold the tooth. Otherwise, if we don't have a provisional on, we've all had this happen where a patient had a provisional come off, and they didn't call us because they didn't want to bug us. What happens? We have to adjust the crown more, right? Why? Because the tooth mesially, mesially drifted, right? The other thing it does is it holds occlusal space. So again, we've seen this where people have had crowns come off or temporaries come off and they didn't come back in. So patient just sort of lets it sit. And then what happens to the tooth? It super erupts. And then what do we have to adjust the heck out of on delivery? The occlusion, right? And it's because of the provisional. The provisional wasn't there to hold the space. Obviously, pulpal protection, if a tooth isn't endotreated and they don't have a provisional on it, it's going to be very sensitive. Obviously, aesthetics, especially in the anterior, people don't want to walk around with their prep teeth exposed. Um, function, right? We need to give patients a place to uh, masticate on and chew on and not having provisionals in uh, is going to diminish that. And then sometimes we use provisionals for diagnostics, right? We need provisionals to work out an incisal edge or try a new vertical dimension or any number of things, right? Retrain tissue, especially around an implant or maybe a tooth that's had crown lengthening surgery, right? So these are all the reasons that we need a provisional. But really the most important two are honestly the first two is holding mesiodistal space and holding occlusal space. Because if we don't have it on there, 
the tooth is going to move. And what would surprise you is how your laboratories build your crowns. So if you're working, if your laboratory is working in a digital workflow at all, so even if you're not digital, most laboratories, especially any big laboratory, is going to take your impression and either scan, either scan the impression with the digital benchtop impression scanner, which will give them a digital model, or they would go ahead and have the model work done and then scan the model work and then work in a digital workflow. The, the fact of the matter is, if you're doing zirconia crowns, if you're placing zirconia crowns in your patient, your laboratory is producing those digitally. They have to be. There's no other way to produce zirconia. And most laboratories will use the following protocols when they design their crowns. So the first one is, is that when crowns get designed in the software, most labs have the interproximal contact open by around 10 microns. 0.01 one hundredth of a millimeter. Open, open contacts. They will design the crowns with open contacts. The other thing that they do is they design the crowns for the most part, four tenths of a millimeter or 400 microns out of occlusion. 400 microns out of occlusion. Well, why do they do that? It's because they know that our provisionals are probably going to be taken out of occlusion and probably have open contacts. So let's walk through this a little bit. Most of the time when a, a dentist preps a crown in the United States, especially if we're running behind, we prep the, the tooth, then we do whatever impression, whether that be analog or digital, that we would normally do. And it's peace out, deuces, I'm on to the next patient, or the hygiene check, or to check Instagram, or my stock portfolio, or make a fantasy football trade, or whatever it is, right? I'm out of the room, and then we delegate the provisional making process to an assistant, which is fine. That's totally fine. But assistants know they got to hurry, that we need the chair. They need to be somewhere else. They got instruments to scrub. They want to check their Instagram, right? Any number of things. And so they sometimes move a little bit faster than they should. And so oftentimes a dental assistant will be trimming a temporary and maybe trim a little bit fast and end up removing a little bit of the contact area so that when the provisional is on, we have an open mesial or distal contact. And then it comes to occlusion. And we have a lot of occlusal philosophies we can talk about. Um, there's Coys, there's Sphere, there's Panky, there's Dawson, there's LVI, and then there's a occlusal philosophy of a dental assistant making a provisional, which is no dots anywhere. That's the occlusal philosophy, right? because they don't want it to break and they don't want it to be high. They don't want this patient to come back in again for them to have to make a new provisional after it broke. So they take it out of occlusion. And then we kick the patient into the wind for two weeks with an open interproximal contact and no occlusal contact. So we have mesial drift and super eruption. And then we have to grind the heck out of our crowns. We have to grind the heck out of our crown, even though the crown was designed with an open interproximal contact and 400 microns out of occlusion. That's how much the tooth moves over two weeks. That's why a provisional is so important. We have to be good at making provisionals or else we're going to have problems at our delivery appointments. And quite frankly, the delivery is the worst part for me because I've already gotten paid, so I need to do it fast. And spending 20 or 30 minutes grinding on a zirconia crown to make it fit is not my idea of a good time. This is a quote from, again, my best friend and mentor, Mike Titola. 90% of single unit posterior crowns that require occlusal adjustment are due to the temporary crown that lacked a central, centric stop and not the fault of the lab. Yet who gets blamed every time when we're 20 minutes in to grinding on the occlusion and we got zirconia dust all over us and we're thinking like, huh, that damn lab, that damn lab, oh, those guys, they just make everything high and bite. Is it that they made everything high and bite or did they make it actually an infra-occlusion and everything moves so much that we now have to grind the heck out of it? It starts with the provisional. That's where we get smooth delivery appointments. Good preparation, good impression or scan, and a good provisional, and everything goes smooth.
So as far as making a provisional, there are lots of different methods. Indirect, direct, crown forms, using methyl methacrylate, or using bisacryl GMA. Making it indirect would be something like biotemps, right, where we use a laboratory designed and fabricated milled um, uh, out of PMMA um, provisional that's either made for our preparation if we prep them first and then have long-term provisionals or that we reline chair side, right? Either way, that would be indirect. Direct would be the way that most of us do it uh, in, the, in the mouth. We do it direct with a preliminary impression. Crown forms, when you don't have, when a patient's lost a crown or you, you know, you don't, you have a broken tooth and you don't have a good preliminary, crown forms can work pretty well for that. Even uh, if uh, a lot of times when I use crown forms, it's just to put them on and to make the provisional impression, the matrix impression with the crown form in. We don't even use the crown form for the actual provisional. We just use it for the preliminary. That works well. Um, and the materials you could use would be methyl methacrylate, jet acrylic, or let's be honest, this acryl GMA is why jet acrylic's great. It's what I learned in dental school. It's slow, it's hot, and it's um, not the most forgiving of materials. And fortunately, bisacryl is a much better option because number one, bisacryl is fast. I love bisacryl sets up most of the time about two minutes, and I can have my provisional done in about five minutes um, if all things go well. It's easy to use. Um, it's strong. This stuff is very strong, especially the stuff that I'm going to show you today that we used on this case. And it looks good. It's a really nice composite. It's basically what bisacryl is. So we can polish it if we want to in the anterior. We can even use glazes and things like that. Um, so it's just by far the most convenient. And we have all of these great uh, characteristics of it. When it comes to our preliminary impression, um, you know, I love this Henry Schein brand alginate alternative. It's a great choice in a triple tray. For this, uh, for making your preliminary impression, it sets fast and it uh, does not have a bad taste and it's super easy and it's easy to work with. So this is what we use for our uh, preliminary matrices or uh, uh, preliminary impression. And so we take that preliminary impression. It almost always looks like this, right? It's kind of what we want. This looks good. The first thing I always do before I start fabricating the matrix is I got to, uh, before I start fabricating the provisional is I got to trim the matrix. Because a lot of times that material goes up into the vestibule and rolls down like a functional impression, like a rolled, you know, border molded margin. But that can often prevent this impression from seeding back in. So I'm almost always going to trim away all that excess. It's just going to make it easier for you to get it back in in the correct dimension that it was and not have any distortion. So I'll take um, a pair of scissors or a 12 blade. And I'll just trim the excess off here to right above the margin of the crown that we're working on. So you can see we've trimmed a lot of that away. That's going to um, create less interferences with the patient closing into it, and it's going to fit way better. I'm going to do the same thing on the opposing, but on the opposing, I actually just trim it all the way to the tray because I don't need the gingival margin. If I trim the gingival margin away, then life is good. It doesn't matter because it's the opposing side. That I need. So once you trim that away, um, it should fit pretty easy into the patient's mouth. I'll almost always do a dry run where I try to put it back in, make sure that it fits when the patient closes and that life is good. The next step is to load and seat the matrix. And I'm going to use ProTemp Plus. This is one of my favorite provisional materials. Here is our uh, box of ProTemp uh, Pro Plus. Um, one thing about ProTemp is it uses the gun that um, is like the 10 to 1 size gun. So not the 50-50 where you have the equal barrels. It's the small side and the big side, right? That's the gun that ProTemp Plus goes in. Um, and the key with this, anytime you load your matrix, is you want to keep your tip into the material. So as you start extruding it, keep it in there until you are done loading it and then pull out as you uh, push a little bit more out so that you don't get any air voids in there. We want that to be a bubble-free um, bolus of bisacryl GMA. Why do I like uh, ProTemp Plus? Uh, it's got really, really high fracture resistance and toughness. So these rarely, rarely, rarely break, um, and, and that that is so rare. And and broken provisionals are just a problem when they come in. You got to remake it. It's you know it's fifteen minutes of chair time. 
You might have to rename the patient. It's a profitability killer, lost and broken provisional. So I don't want a, a material that's going to break ever. Like it, you know, this it needs to be hit with a hammer for it to break, in my opinion. Um, the filler that's in the Pro Temp Plus um, is makes the material really strong, but it also gives us really nice aesthetic without a bunch of polishing and glazing. And I still on anteriors, I'm going to polish and glaze the heck out of them because I'm really anal about my anterior provisionals. But on one like this, I, I may not need to polish it at all. Um, you know, a posterior one, I'm, especially a single unit posterior, I'm probably not going to need to polish it at all if I do for 10 or 20 seconds with the composite polisher. And I definitely don't need to, to glaze it. When I, when I spend my time polishing and glazing is on like a multi-unit anterior provisional. Comes in six shades. Um, and it also uh, matches... Filtech Supreme Ultra Flowable. So we've all had a situation where we've gotten a, a bubble in our provisional and um, having a, a material that you can use to patch it that, that is like chemically designed to go with it is a really nice thing. And so you get a good uh, bond between that patch and the provisional material itself. And we all have Filtech Supreme Ultra Flowable laying around the office. Uh, and so that's easy. So it's easy to repair um, any little holes or, or spots that you get on your provisional without having to remake it. Sets pretty quickly, intraorally, under two minutes, we're ready to go. Um, the total set time, so under two minutes in the mouth, by the time I get it in the mouth and all that, total set time of five minutes. Um, and it is light curable. So if you use a, a, uh, a clear polyvinyl as your matrix, you can cure through it and start working on it even faster. Um, and, uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, very easy to trim to nice margins. So we get good gingival health, which helps us when we deliver our crown. The less bleeding gums we have when we deliver our crown, the better, right? The easier it is. So once we let the provisional set in the mouth, I'm going to remove the matrix um, from the mouth. If you are living well and uh, being a, 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 a good person, the provisional will come out in the matrix impression. Um, if you are like me, 99% of the time, it's stuck on the tooth. The provisional comes out with nothing in it, and I got to take some hemostats and wiggle it off the tooth. Um, hopefully, we don't have an undercut. If you use a reverse crown prep technique, you will not have an undercut um, because of the, uh, the way that we prep the crown. So you'll get it off pretty easy. And then I'll always light cure it for five or 10 seconds just to make sure it's all set up. And we all know what this looks like, right? We've got our provisional with all our ragged, untrimmed edges on it, right? Here it is from the intaglio. Here it is from the occlusal. The next thing I do. Even me, after doing this for 15 years, is I will mark the interproximal contact with the pencil. So it looks like this. You will see a shiny spot on the interproximal where that material cured up against the next, the, the tooth easier, either mesially or distal to this one. And that will leave a shiny spot that you can see in the light. I still, to this day, take a pencil and mark that because if when I'm done trimming, that pencil mark is still there, I know that we are going to have interproximal contact. If you remove this mark, you will have an open contact. So if you want good mesiodistal contacts, take five seconds with the mechanical pencil and mark the contact area, and then don't touch that spot when you go back to trim. Now, when you uh, start trimming, the goal of us trimming is to kind of remove these triangles of flash. That's really what we want to do with this with this um, provisional is remove the triangles of flash. And they kind of form in these planes like this. So I will take, um, I just use a diamond burr that I use to prep the tooth, like whatever eight, five, six round barrel diamond burr that's, that's on my burr block. I don't want another set of burrs for this. I will just use my round uh, uh, barrel diamond burr in a uh, slow, in a at about forty thousand RPM, and I will just trim away these sharp triangles. And once you trim away all the triangles, you will be left with a pretty smooth restoration. And so then finally, that leaves us to check occlusion, and we have to make sure that we leave a centric stop, because if we don't leave a centric stop, you can see it right in the middle of the tooth here, and a little one on that palatal cusp. If we don't leave a centric stop. We are just begging to get super eruption and to have to adjust our crown at the, at the delivery appointment, which I don't want. I want my delivery appointments to be seven minutes or less. 
Um, I almost wish I was like a drive through that had like a clock that, you know, when a car was waiting in the drive through, it just started timing it. I want my deliveries to be seven minutes or less. And if we make a good provisional and if we make a good impression, either digital or analog, we can do it. And, and that, that is the, the, the seven minutes or less is the, is the majority. It's, it's, it's the rule, not the exception, right? Um, yeah, every once in a while we have one that, that, uh, for whatever reason, uh, takes a little bit longer than that, but for the most part, if you make a good, if you do a good preparation, make a good provisional, um, your deliveries will be uneventful in seven minutes or less. Then finally, we submit our provisional in. Um, in this case, I'm using ReliX temporary NE, non eugenol Um, I want a temporary cement that's strong, strong enough to hold it in without it coming off. Again, I don't want to deal with provisionals that come off. I also don't want to use something like Duralon very often that's going to you know, make me have to prep it off um, because I don't want to necessarily anesthetize the patient and waste the time of prepping off the provisional. Um, temp uh, NE, Reliax Temp NE is a great sort of middle ground between um, you know, uh, you know, not quite as strong as polycarboxylate and Duralon, but will give you enough retention that you need and is easy to clean off. And the NE, the non eugenol means that it will not interfere with resin bonding. Should you choose to resin bond your final crown on, right? You may choose to loot, uh, at which case a eugenol cement would particularly matter all that much. Um, but if you decided to use a resin cement, either self etch uh, or self adhesive, then at that point, if you've used a eugenol based temporary cement, you're going to have some issues with that. And here's our provisional in place. Here is our provisional from the buckle. And then we get our crown back um, a scant 10 days later. Um, and we have that delivered in. Look how healthy that tissue is all the way around because we have a nice trimmed provisional um, and uh, material uh, in the ProTemp Plus that promotes that gingival health by being so smooth. Um, we get tissue that looks like this when we deliver. And uh, we submitted this with uh, ReliX uh, Universal along with uh, Scotch Bond Universal Plus um, together. And, you know, that's going to bond with the zirconia in. And it's going to do really well because we had such a clean, dry field, got a nice preparation. We made a nice image. The lab made us a beautiful crown. And so that's how this should go every time. And again, um, you know, it, it happened to me today. We had a patient come in with a broken tooth. I had 40 minutes. Um, I have a, a relatively small office. I don't have a bunch of operatories where people can just chill and wait. So we got to run on time. And it's, you know, your options are when somebody comes with a broken tooth, reappoint them and risk losing, uh, you know, that that patient either to another dentist or them deciding it's not that big of a priority um, or getting it done. And so if you have a system and you work through that system, you can get it done. And that makes the difference in you and your team hitting bonus or not, right? Is those crowns that you can work in, um, the people that come in in need of a crown, getting it in, getting it done and doing it well not having um, lost provisionals, not having crowns we have to adjust a lot at delivery, and having good, healthy gum tissue at our delivery appointment. So our goals were to reduce the tooth adequately for material. The reverse crown, prep technique, reverse crown preparation technique gives you that ability. It gives you a system that you follow every time to make sure that you give the lab what they need to make you a great restoration. We want to give the laboratory an accurate representation. Whether that be analog with the material like imprint or, um, or digital with whatever scanning system you have, we need to give our laboratory an adequate representation of what we've done for them. And then finally, we've got to keep the tooth where it needs to be so that it doesn't move and we don't have to grind the heck out of our crown at delivery. Those are our three goals of a, any indirect restoration appointment. And we got to do it in less than an hour so that we're profitable, right? And I think with this method, I think we can do it. So um, hopefully that will give you guys just some re-emphasis and some, some refocus on the fundamentals of what's important to a practice. We all like doing all on fours and veneers and all those big heavy things, implant placements and whatnot. But really the bread and butter of most of our practices is being profitable and predictable with the procedures we do every day. And it matters now more than ever with inflation up, you know, everyone gets the pinch but us. You know, if you're on a PPO, you know, your lab has raised the fee on you. Um, you know, if your deliveries are more expensive, your team's asking for more money, and Delta's not giving you any more reimbursement for that for that crown prep. 
So we have to be more efficient in order to stay profitable. And that's how we do it. So uh, you guys can reach me anytime with questions, jaustindds at me.com. And you, you can reach me anywhere on social media at Joshua Austin DDS, except for Snapchat, because I'm 43 years old. And any 43-year-old man who's on Snapchat is up to some devious stuff. And I'm not on TikTok either, because I take Lipitor. And they don't like people who take cholesterol medication do the Dougie on a, on a TikTok. So really, Instagram is the place to find me, at Joshua Austin DDS. And now I'm going to kick it over to Gary, and we're going to do some questions and answers. And then we'll be all wrapped up. Great job, Josh. Wonderful job. Um, and oh, every, the audience, you can also reach him, Joshua Austin DDS on Peloton if you're a writer. So yes. Search him there yes. and see it. Uh, Josh got a few questions for you. And the one thing I do have to say, I, you know, know Detola and he's very good at communicating to the profession. I hadn't seen the reverse crown prep technique. So I hope this gets it out a little bit. Um, and also, uh, the attendees tonight, there's a pretty well-educated group of attendees that some of the names I recognize. One of them is Dr. Gary Hack, who's a professor at Maryland, uh, University of Maryland Dental School. And so it leads to one of my questions. Are, do you know of any dental schools that are teaching this technique? So I know Loma Linda, Linda um, brings uh, Mike Tatola in every year. Uh, Richard Young runs their aesthetic course, and he brings uh, Mike in. To do the revert to teach them the reverse crown prep technique, and I believe um, AT or I'm sorry, Midwest University, um, which is in uh, Arizona, does uh, teaches that as well to their senior dental students. So it's starting to get out there a little bit. And again, yeah. I think the biggest thing is is that we just stick to a system. That may not be the system that's for you, um, but as long as you have a system, that's that's what's really important. And your team should know that system, and you should know that system, and you should execute that system every time. Great. Uh, one of the questions, and it ties into that well, I assume your team members know your systems. So who in your office actually makes the provisionals? It's a great question. So if it's um, if it's an anterior or if it's multi-units, I 100% of the time make those. If it's a single unit, I will make it as long as I don't have to be in another room for a hygiene exam to keep my hygienist um, caught up or be in another room to anesthetize or whatever. So if I can't, I do. Um, and a lot of times it'll be like, I will start it. So I will put it in, I'll load the matrix. I'll put it in. I will then, you know, pull it out, cure it. And I'll like, I'll trim the, uh, inner pro the axials and, and, and the gingival margin. Um, and then I'll have them adjust the occlusion. And they kind of know what I'm looking for. Like that little single dot somewhere on the tooth to make sure that it's, that it's not going to move. Right. So Sometimes it's a team effort. Um, I would say maybe once out of every 10 to 15 crown preps, I, you know, am getting pulled in five other directions. And so I have to have them make it. But that would almost always be on a single unit posterior. Um, and then I always check it before they go. So I, I'm kind of an outlier there. But again, I know I just know how important that provisional is. And it's really the most underrated part of the procedure. And if that part is wrong, the next part's going to be hard. And I don't want the next part to be hard. I want the next part to be really easy because <laughs> we put the we put our crown deliveries in another room. Like that's another column of of non production that's happening while I'm producing in another room. So we can't afford for me to be spending 20 minutes delivering a crown because I got to be in another room prepping something else. Right? That's the only way we can make this work. So I've just found that when I started making my provisionals again about seven or eight years ago, um, things got way more reliable. So the answer is I do it mostly. Um, but if not, I always have oversight over my team just to make sure we're not um, creating a problem that will come up at delivery. Okay, great. Um, and you showed primarily in all ceramic restoration uh, leads into this question. Are there any situations where you can't use the reverse crown prep technique? Yeah, that's a good question as well. So um, for any material you can use it on, you would just change the round diamond burr, right? And, and, and the depth cuts, right? So if you're doing a gold, um, you know, you would you you could reduce away less. You could have a thinner margin there. Use a smaller round diamond burr. So any material it will work on. It works great for anything milled, which is about ninety percent, ninety five percent of what is done today in in the country between um, either three Y zirconia and then the more aesthetic four Y five Y zirconia and then lithium disilicate. You know, that's ninety to ninety five percent of what's done. And again, those are all milled. So the round diamond burr and that chamfer is perfect for that. 
Um, if you, my, my associate loves to prep a shoulder for milled crowns. And I'm just like, you're wasting your time because the mill is going to over mill. The mill can't mill that 90 degree shoulder. So it's going to over mill that. And so you're, it's basically going to mill a chamfer and then you're going to fill that extra space with cement. So why even prep it? So, um, but that's an argument I've gotten into with my associate many times. Um, <laughs> As far as situations where you can't do it, the only one is if there's a previous crown there. So if you're cutting off an old crown, you can't really do it at that point because everything is kind of roughly prepped anyway. So that's about the only spot. And then the only other one is if you have um, like deep, uh, like class five uh, cervical decay, um, where when you go in and put the, the round diamond burr in, you still have decay axial to that. It doesn't work really great for that because then you're excavating decay and you're going to end up with a weird overhang. So then at that point, I would I would go ahead and restore, get the the uh, the decay out of there and then fill it in and then go back and prep it kind of any other way that, that you would. So those are kind of the two scenarios that you really couldn't previous crown or sort of deep cervical decay, which we all know those are really hard situations to deal with. Well, we're at time here, and any other questions, I'll get to you, Josh, that you can respond via email as well. I want to thank you for your participation, um, the audience, as well as you, Dr. Austin, for the expertise and the time, and to 3M for sponsoring this webinar tonight. We did record it. There was a question about that. There were some sound issues maybe at the beginning. So we did record it, and we'll email you the recording out sometime next week. If you are interested in attending future webinars, please visit henryshine.com slash webinars for all the information. And we would appreciate your feedback via a survey that will pop up upon your screen shortly. Thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Dr. Austin, thanks so much. Have Thank a great you guys. evening. Have a good night. Everyone.